Welcome to the next lecture on modulation techniques for mobile communications. The outline of today's talk is as follows. We will first summarize briefly what we learnt so far. Then we will focus on FM modulation. We will look at the direct method and the indirect method for frequency modulation that is generation of FM signals. Of course, the other important thing is FM demodulation. We will look at the following four techniques, the slope detection technique, the zero crossing method, the PLL for FM detection and quadrature detection. So, this will be the brief outline of today's talk. Let us first summarize what we learnt last time. We looked at the different kinds of modulation techniques popularly used in mobile communications. Specifically, we looked at the analog modulation techniques and we talked about AM amplitude modulation versus frequency modulation FM. Then we discussed amplitude modulation in detail including generation of AM signals as well as demodulation of AM signals. Now today, even though our focus is on FM or frequency modulation, it is a subclass of a general class of modulation techniques called angle modulation. What is angle modulation? The angle of the carrier is varied according to the amplitude of the modulating signal in one line that is angle modulation. Now, there are two most important kinds of angle modulation. One is frequency modulation or FM, the other one is phase modulation or PM. In frequency modulation, the instantaneous frequency of the carrier is varied according to a modulating signal. FM does not touch the amplitude of the carrier and hence it is sometimes called the constant envelope method. Phase modulation on the other hand uh, plays with the instantaneous phase of the carrier and is varied according to the modulating signal. Now, if you look at the generalized sinusoidal carrier signal, S t is given by A naught cos theta t and here we can write it as A naught cos omega c t plus theta naught. Omega c is 2 pi f c, f c being the carrier frequency and theta naught is the phase. The instantaneous phase in this case is given by omega i equal to the derivative of the theta d theta by d t. Now, we have to either modulate the frequency part as per the input waveform or the phase part so as to either obtain frequency modulation or phase modulation. In general, both these techniques are called angle modulation because of this thing. So, we are changing theta which is the angle of cosine. Let us look at an example of angle modulation, a very simple example. First consider the figure on this top right end, here is a simple square wave. So, for example, for duration from 0 to t, we have a signal which frequency f 1 and for a higher amplitude here, the square wave, I have a higher frequency and then again then there is a trough, I again have a lower frequency and higher frequency. So, very simply I am changing the frequency and depicting what could be the possible input m t. Slightly more complicated case when the amplitude of the message is varying continuously. So, the frequency must vary continuously. So, as the amplitude is low here, the frequency is low amplitude is increasing, frequency is increasing, amplitude peaks of the message, frequency peaks and gradually goes down and the frequency decreases. Just conveying the amplitude of the message in terms of the frequency. So, let us define certain parameters. So, we have the message signal m t, the f m signal is given by s subscript f m a c cosine 2 pi f c t k 
carrier plus m t integrated with respect to time. So, S f m can be expressed like follows. The power in the f m signal is given by a c squared by 2 and the frequency modulation index is defined as beta subscript f is k f a m over w where w is the highest frequency component in the message signal. We will use these parameters later today to characterize the spectrum of the frequency modulated signal. A m is the peak value of the modulating signal. So, A m and W both figure in the calculation of frequency modulation index. Question? So, sir, index becomes uh, the proportion of the amplitude to the highest amplitude to the highest frequency. Yes, if you look at beta f, physically it is delta f over W. So, it is actually the variation in the frequency. Clearly, the frequency has to be changed as per the in input amplitude. Now, there has to be a range. So, the modulation index or specifically the frequency modulation index is a measure of how much is the variation in frequency delta f normalized by the maximum or the highest frequency component in the message signal. So, there is a very physical meaning attached to it. Let us look at the other brother which is the phase modulation phase modulation signal S subscript PM T can be given as A C, the amplitude of the carrier cosine 2 pi F C T plus K naught M T. Directly the message signal is being used to alter the phase. The phase modulation index here is B subscript theta is equal to K theta A m. The power in the P m signal is again A subscript C squared by 2, the bandwidth is 2 times delta F. So, clearly if you compare the S subscript P m T with the previous case S F m T, then we observe that the F m signal can simply be generated by first integrated M T and then give the input to the phase modulator. So, what does this mean? P m when given the input of m t integrated is actually equal to the frequency modulation and on the other side if you give to the f m the derivative with respect to time of the input m t you get the phase modulation. Here graphically it is given by this m t coming in passing through an integrator then through a phase modulator gives you frequency modulation and on the other hand message signal derivative with respect to time, then passing through the frequency modulator gives you the phase modulated output. Let us now look at the spectral aspects. Now, for a frequency modulated carrier S subscript F m, it is we know given by A cosine omega C t plus k f integrated m t d t and the general equation for an f m carrier can be given as follows. So, you can just expand this out and you will get S f m t as A cosine omega c t carrier multiplied by cosine k f g t minus A sin omega c t sin k f g t coming from this first equation. We will use this general equation of f m carrier to do further analysis on f m. Also, if we understand that an f m carrier can be represented as follows, we can think of efficient modulation techniques for f m. Now, first consider the narrow band scenario. Let us define narrow band as the case when k f g t is much much less than pi by 2. Now, in this scenario from the general equation of an f m carrier which is this, the spectrum of the narrow band f m can simply be obtained by taking the Fourier transform. 
So, for narrow band scenario, the spectrum of F m is given by this equation. Now, for the wide band case, we have the condition k subscript f g t greater than pi by 2 and in that case, if you write S f m in that formula a c cos 2 pi f c t plus 2 pi k f integration of m t d t. If the modulating signal is a sinusoid, that is m t is actually a cosine function, then if you solve these two, you get the S f m t as a c cos 2 pi f c t plus k f a m over f m sin 2 pi f m t. What is a m? A m is the amplitude of the sinusoid, f m is a frequency. Now, continuing with the wide band case, let us start with the general function of the f m carrier. As we realized, it is a product of cosines minus product of sines. We have the carrier frequency here and the message information here. So, the resulting signal function, if you do the basic trigonometry, is given by S subscript f m t is a m cosine omega c t plus an interesting term b subscript f sin omega m t. So, if you can apply a trigonometric identity, you can get the following expansion. So, you have been able to express the time domain frequency modulated signal in terms of a m beta subscript f omega m. So, let us talk about the frequency modulation index. Frequency modulation index beta subscript f is defined as k f a m over w as we saw it tells you the maximum frequency deviation possible divided by the maximum bandwidth of the modulating signal. And for the phase modulation index, beta subscript p is defined as k theta a m is nothing but the maximum deviation in the phase. Okay. While designing a transmitter, these two beta f and beta subscript p must be taken into consideration. Okay. Both give us a notion of how much maximum frequency deviation in the case of f m and phase deviation in the case of p m is permissible. If I have to have amplifiers, uh, I should have them working linearly in this domain. Let us talk about the approximate bandwidth of f m. We have the Carlson's rule. The upper bound f c plus minus f m is given by b t is equal to 2 beta f plus 1 f m. Beta m comes from this frequency modulation index and the lower bound is given by b t is equal to 2 delta f, where delta f is coming from the product of k f and a m, a m being the peak value of the modulation signal. Just a small example, if you look at the first generation mobile communication systems, the US AMPS cellular system, which used f m for beta f is equal to 3, f m is equal to 4 kilohertz. If you use this Carlson's rule, you get the upper bound b t by plugging in the formula 32 kilohertz and lower bound 24 kilohertz. So, now let us now spend some time looking at f m modulation techniques. Now, there are two broad categories in which we can classify f m modulation methods. The first one is called the direct method, 
which as the name suggests simply varies the f c carrier frequency according to m t the message. The indirect method uses two kinds, one could be a balanced modulator which generates a narrow band f m signal or frequency multiplication techniques. Let us now look at these methods. So, in a direct method the voltage controlled oscillator or VCO varies carrier with the base band amplitude. A varactor which is nothing but a voltage variable capacitor or a voltage control oscillator is used to simply control the frequency of the carrier with respect to the input m t thereby generate f m signals. But the problem is the moment you go from narrow band to wide band f m f c is no longer stable and if f c is not stable then we introduce inherent distortions. So, a PLL a phased locked loop must be used to stabilize the f c. This is the direct method. What is it? Simply change the frequency of the carrier proportionate to the input amplitude. This is a simple realization of <coughs> the direct method where this is the varactor and here the modulating signal is there. So, simply by changing the input here you can obtain a modulated signal. So, it is extremely easy to use except that it works only for narrow band scenarios fine. Please note as you change the input amplitude here you change the current being drawn here. And as the voltage across this changes, the varactor will have a different frequency output corresponding to the voltage across it. Yeah, the question is what does the PLL do if I have to stabilize it? Yes, the PLL will ensure that the F c the carrier frequency is locked. So, it, it does not deviate much even though we move across the wide band. Now, let us look at the indirect method. It was proposed by Armstrong and the approximate narrow band f m is basically carrier plus s s b 90 degrees out of phase. Where does this figure out from. See, if you remember the general formula S subscript F m t which is nothing but A c cos 2 pi F c t plus 2 pi just a minute if you do a Taylor series expansion on this equation. you can get an approximate value of S f m. The problem with this method is phase noise in the system. So, the phase noise kind of kills the system. Let us look at an indirect method. So, here you have the modulating signal, it passes through an integrator minus 90 degrees phase shift and here you add them up with a negative sign and you obtain the narrow band f m. It is nothing but a realization of this equation. Carrier 90 degree phase shifted sign here cosine right and here theta t. Just the realization of this equation in this method. If you have a frequency multiplier, you can obtain a wide band f. Let us look at an example. Your m t comes in, it is just that example of the indirect method, integrate, then d s b s c. 
here you have a sin omega c t coming in and with a minus pi by 2 phase shift you have a cosine omega c t summation here you get the f m you do a frequency multiplier. The problem with this method is as you increase the frequency multiplier number n the phase noise increases that is the problem frequency converter power amplifier and radiate out. So, this is a method an indirect method to generate f m just the realization of the Armstrong method. Now, let us spend some time talking about the f m detection. So, the demodulator can be either a simple frequency to amplitude converter circuit that is find out the frequency and then convert it to the amplitude or you can have frequency discriminator. Now, f m detection techniques can be classified as slope detector, zero crossing detector, PLL for f m detection and quadrature detection. Let us talk about all of these one by one. Let us talk about the slope detector circuit. In fact, the only job of this is to figure out what is the instantaneous frequency. So, here is the input to the limiter, then there is V subscript 1 t which is given by V 1 cosine 2 pi f c t plus theta t. Please remember right now we are trying to demodulate the f m. So, the signal that we already have is a frequency modulated signal. What do we do next? We differentiate it just a simple differentiation gives you the following and then do an envelope detection on this. The moment you do envelope detection you get v out as v 1 2 pi f c t plus d by d t theta t. This is nothing but your if you do an envelope detection you get v 1 2 pi f c plus 2 pi k f m t you have recovered back your message. So, it is a very simple and elegant method differentiate and then follow it up with envelope detector. A very simple method is called the slope detection. Now, the second method is the zero crossing detector. Here again we have a limiter followed by a differentiator then a monostable vibrator a low pass filter. What does it do? It physically counts the number of zero crossings. Now, if the frequency is more there will be more number of zero crossings in the unit time. It is as simple as that. So, what is done is if you have an input f m signal as depicted here clearly the frequency is changing depending upon the amplitude which modulated it. Correspondingly based on the zero crossing after the limiter you obtain a pulse strain. Clearly, if, if my signal has been of a lower frequency here I will have broader pulses and for a higher frequency I will have narrower pulses. Now, I must differentiate this to find out where the pulses begin. So, after you differentiate it you exactly get the location of the start points. In effect you found out where are the zero crossings. Wherever the frequency was high I have more closely spaced impulses whereas, wherever the frequency was low I have far apart pulses. 
pass it through a monostable vibrator and kind of average it out by passing through a low pass filter and you obtain your amp modulating signal. Wherever there was a low amplitude, you had sparse density of impulses, wherever there was a high amplitude, you had closely spaced impulses. So, it is a very simple method by just counting the zero crossings, hence it is called the zero crossing detector. Question? Should we use the monostable multiplier? Question being asked is, is there a smart technique to directly go from V2 to V out? Basically, question being asked is, is there a circuit or an algorithm which takes this pulse train or impulse train and converts it into this one? Yeah, if you possibly pass it through a low pass filter right at this point, you will get something like this but maybe a little jittery. Right? So, through a monostable vibrator, you have basically put in some more energy in those impulses and then when you average it out, then you get a smooth function. So, it is in principle you can go from V2 directly to V out also. Now, the third and another popular technique is to use the phase locked loop or PLL for FM detection. The philosophy is very simple. You have a, an internal VCO or voltage controlled oscillator and you generate your own frequency. You have a free phase detector which checks the error in the phase with respect to the input modulated FM signal and your own self generated oscillator and your job is to minimize the error. If you have been able to minimize the error, you have able to track the phase and if you have been able to track the phase, the input to the voltage control oscillator is actually the voltage of MT, it is the demodulated signal. So, it is a very simple yet elegant method of demodulating FM. So, let us now look at the fourth method which is called the quadrature detection. Quadrature detection is one of the most popular detection techniques simply because it can be implemented on an IC at a very low cost. The phase difference between the original FM signal and the signal at the output of the phase shift network is detected. Please look at the diagram below. So, we have an input FM signal going to a multiplier and here it is passed through a phase shift network with a minus 90 degree shift at FC. In the following slide, we will look at how the phase characteristic of this phase shift network looks like, but then you multiply it, pass it through a low pass filter and you automatically get the demodulated signal out. Please note the output of the phase detector will be proportional to the instantaneous frequency of the input FM signal, right, and thereby demodulating the signal. This slide shows the characteristics of a phase shift network with constant gain and linear phase. on this diagram, if you look on the y axis is the phase shift and the x axis is the frequency, here is the FM signal and this is the linear phase shift. So, the phase response function for a quadrature detection method is given by phi as a function of frequency is minus pi by 2 plus 2 pi k f minus f c this is the error in the frequency. The output from an FM signal is given by the following and the instantaneous frequency F i is F c plus k F m t. 
Now what happens at the product de detector? At the product detector, if you remember this is the diagram of the product detector. So, so the V phi t is rho squared A c squared cosine phi f i t is simply given by this and if you work it out, you can write it as rho squared A c squared sin 2 pi k k f m t and when you simplify it for a small angle, then the V output can be written like this. Well, there are a lot of terms here, but at the end rho squared A c squared 2 pi capital K k f all are constants and you are left with a constant times m of t. So, this quadrature detection technique is a very simple method to obtain m t and it is as you can see fairly easy to implement in hardware. A phase shift network, a multiplier and a low pass filter and hence its popularity. So, the bottom line is if you do the basic maths, you come up with V output t as some constant times m t and once we have got this, we have recovered our modulating signal, our job is done. Now, let us spend some time talking about the trade offs between the signal to noise ratio S n r and the bandwidth in an F m signal. So, if you work out the output of an F m receiver is given by S n r out is 6 beta f plus 1, where beta f is the frequency modulation index and V subscript p is the peak to 0 value of the modulating signal m t times the signal to noise ratio at the input. So, post processing this is your S n r. Please note there is a beta subscript f here and a beta squared here. So, somewhere it is proportional to beta f cubed. beta f remember is the modulating frequency. The input to the F m receiver S n r n here is given by A c squared by 2, this is nothing but the power in the carrier and here it is the noise power spectral density multiplied with the bandwidth. So, this is the S n r in. So, using these two we can obtain the S n r out. Now, if you want to compare input to an A m receiver is nothing but A c squared by 2, the 2 should go up n naught times b b is the bandwidth and output of the SM, F m receiver for a sinusoidal m t is simplified as S n r out by plugging into the previous value, you get 3 beta f squared S n r in a m. So, as you can see that with respect to the S n r in of a m given by this formula, I have a flexibility, a design possibility to improve my S n r out simply by playing and increasing the beta subscript f. Question? So, over here uh, we talked that uh, frequency modulation does not depend on the amplitude. So, why are we considering the S n r over here? Okay. So, the question being asked is what relationship, why are we considering this S n r and this S n r? So, there are two things one is the S n r at the input and then post processing there is an S n r at the output. This is true both for A m and F m. However, what we are trying to do in this slide is to see what is the relative advantage of F m over A m. Now, we need some common platform to compare. So, what we find out from 
very basic calculation that the SNR in at AM is given by this formula. Right? We saw last time that this is SNR or signal to noise ratio is the signal power divided by the noise power. Signal power is AC squared by 2, noise power is N naught beta. Right? We are assuming additive white Gaussian noise. Then if you write it in terms of your previous equation, this SNR out for this one, you obtain SNR out for FM is 3 beta F squared SNR in for AM. So, I have a possibility to tweak and improve my SNR performance by just changing beta f. So, I can very easily compare and trade off, but please remember beta f comes at a cost, it comes at the cost of bandwidth. So, I can play with the bandwidth and hence improve beta f and thereby improving my SNR. There is no such luxury for the case of AM. So, the SNR at the output of an FM detector is 3 beta f squared greater than the input SNR of an AM signal with the same RF bandwidth. SNR at the output of an FM detector increases as the cube of the bandwidth of the message. The threshold extension technique is used in FM to improve the detection sensitivity to about SNR in of 6 dB. So, these are the relative advantages of FM clearly over AM. So, a, a brief slide on the relative comparison. On the left, we have the attributes of frequency modulation, on the right is amplitude modulation. So, FM signals are less susceptible to atmospheric noise because information is stored as frequency variation rather than amplitude variation. But noise as you know is additive wide Gaussian noise hits the amplitude directly. AM on the other hand is more susceptible to noise because of the amplitude encoding. FM signals clearly occupy more bandwidth, AM signals are more bandwidth efficient. We saw last time that for frequency modulation techniques, we can use efficient class C amplifiers at the transmitter which are cheaper whereas for class A and B amplifiers must be used for amplitude modulation. The modulation index can be varied to obtain a greater SNR 6 dB for each doubling in bandwidth. Here modulation index cannot be changed automatically. So, we have a flexibility to improve our output SNR for FM. So, let us summarize today's lecture. We started off with the different frequency modulation techniques. Specifically, we talked about the direct method using the VCO or the voltage controlled oscillator. Then we talked about the indirect method, one proposed by Armstrong. We looked at four popular FM demodulation techniques. We started off with the slope detection, followed by the zero crossing method, then the phased lock loop for FM detection and finally, the quadrature detection. We will conclude our lecture here and in the next lecture, we will talk about digital modulation techniques. Thank you.